do a miracle today, and that's our prayer as we listen to God's word, that he would do a miracle of, of transforming lives. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. We are continuing our series, Out of the Darkness into the Light. Our theme verse is found in Isaiah. If we could move the slide, please. Um, there you go. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of of deep darkness on them has light shown. Last week, we looked at the rejection of the light. The Jesus came not to condemn the world, and yet there will be those who persist in rejecting what he offers. And we said that we need to receive the light of Christ and apply his truth so God may be glorified. Though if you are a child of light, that we need to come to the light, walk in the light, so that we could demonstrate to those who are afraid of the light what the light really looks like. People reject the light because they don't understand the love of God for them. They think it's a condemning light rather than a light that wants to save and a light that wants to help. So we said that if you ever doubt the love of God for your life, that you need to look at the cross. That you are not only worth a son to God, you are worth an only son to God. This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 9, where we will look at Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. But before we do that, let's look to God in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to you for your love for us. We are grateful, Lord, for the miracle of new birth. We are grateful, Lord, for the miracle of transforming us taking us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to continue to understand all the blessings that we have in Christ. And having done so, Lord, that we would be led to a deeper love for him and a more vibrant worship of him. I pray, Father, that you would bless our study, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you in this congregation wear glasses? Can I see glasses? You wear glasses? Okay. Somebody, so how many of you used to wear glasses, but you've had LASIK surgery? Okay, that, no? A few? We had a few in the, okay, one. That's cool. How many of you who still wear glasses have, how many of you have ever lost your glasses? Yeah? I, I lose mine about once a day. <laughs> and, and I remember one time, when they first came out with this really light glasses that you could hardly feel it on your face. I was looking for my glasses and I looked at the mirror and I was wearing it. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, I'm so glad no one will ever know this. <laughs> it's frustrating to lose your glasses. It's frustrating to lose it when you're late for an appointment. It's frustrating to lose it when you have to bring your kids to school. They're going to be late to school. It's just frustrating not to be able to see and not not have your glasses. But imagine not only losing your glasses, but losing your eyesight. Imagine being born blind and never experiencing the, the beauty of this dazzling orange sunset that we see and take for granted. Imagine never seeing the blue skies, the roaring waves, and to see the the blue skies reflected on the ocean. Imagine never seeing snow-capped mountains of the Sierras. Imagine never having seen the faces of your loved ones, your parents, your best friend. Imagine what it would be like to be born blind in a society where there are no government assistance, no welfare. And having to feel your way to a familiar spot where you could beg for a few coins so that you could eat that day. Imagine what it must have been like for this blind man that we will talk about this morning. It's important to know the context of his story in order to understand what Jesus was about to do in his life. The context of the man born blind, the story of the man born blind and his healing, is found all the way back in John chapter 7, where it says, Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. In 
some translation, it is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a time when the Jewish people celebrated the fact that God was faithful to them while they were wandering in the wilderness. And one of the ceremonies during this time was the ceremony of light, where they would light up these four giant pillars in the court of women, and it would be so bright that it would not only illumine the temple proper area, but this light could be seen throughout Jerusalem. It was that bright. It was in the background of this blazing torches that Jesus makes this proclamation in chapter 8, verse 12, where he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The moment he said that, the Jewish leaders contradicted him. They said, you're just making that up. Your testimony is not valid. And Jesus says it is valid because my father testifies on my account. My father testifies that what I say to you is true. The Jewish leader said, who is your father? Our father is Abraham. And Jesus says, your father is not Abraham because if he were your father, then you would follow me. You would listen to me. He says, your father is the devil. The Jewish leader said, how can you say that you know Abraham when you're not 50 years old? How can you say you know Abraham? Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones and they tried to kill him and they, he eluded their grasp. In chapter 9, our text, he once again says that he is the light of the world but chapter 9 is devoted to proving his statement in the fact that he is able to heal someone who is in darkness. And he's able to help them see or enable them through the miracle of sight to see light. There are seven miracles in the book of John. Each one was a sign pointing to who Jesus was, to the power of Jesus, to the proclamation of Jesus, to the fact that Jesus is not only Messiah, that he is God. Remember, we looked at John 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those seven miracles point to the fact that he is deity, that he is not only the Son of God, he is God the Son. In chapter 9, it was the miracle or the sign of the healing of the blind man. But John recorded this not only to show who Jesus was, John recorded this to show our helpless condition. That mankind is in a desperate situation because we are in darkness. As you begin to understand the plight of this blind man, you begin to understand our job of helping people who are still in darkness to see the light. It shows not only the desperate condition of man, it shows our responsibility to share the light with them. And so in this passage, there are three things that we discover about this man and how our response is to the light. First of all, you see the blindness of the man before he met Christ. The blindness of the man before he met Christ. Jesus healed this blind man to show us the work that we must do for God. In verse 1, it says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Now notice the disciples saw it as, an in, uh, uh, as a teaching moment for themselves or a training moment. And so they asked this question in verse 2. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And so there was a man with a congenital disease that robbed them of his eyesight. And instead of trying to help the man, the disciples asked a theological question. They turned to Jesus and said, who sinned? Because in those days, they thought that if something bad happens to you, it must be because of a particular sin that you committed. But there's a problem. The man was born blind. So did he sin in his mother's womb? Or was it a result of his parents' sin? Interesting theological question. And so Jesus briefly answers and says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, 
but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Notice the disciples missed it. They missed the fact that whenever you see a need, it is not simply an occasion to talk about theology. It is an occasion to help, but they didn't lift a finger to help. Notice what it says again in verse 1. And he passed by and what? He saw. He saw. You could look and not see. Amen? That happens all the time. We see, we, we look and there are people in need and we go on and study our Bible. Oh, I got to have my devotion. We want to learn more and we haven't lifted a finger to opportunities that God presents to us so that we could help. It says, he saw. He saw. And here, Jesus uses this occasion not only to, to talk about the spiritual condition of man, but the fact that we need to see with eyes of compassion that there is a work that we must do, but if it is to glorify God, it must be done lovingly. We are to see that people need the Lord. There are times that God allows suffering and trials to come so that God is glorified and we could help those who are in need. There's a work that needs to be done. But we need to see through Jesus' eyes. We need to look with eyes of compassion. It says, Jesus saw. And to me, that's an encouragement because he sees us. He sees your need and he cares for you. He knows what you're going through. That as you come into this, into this place, that he sees the, the miracle that needs to happen in your life. And he cares for you. Do we see? So we need to work lovingly so that God is glorified. Secondly, we need to work urgently because our time is limited. In verse 4, he says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. By the way, we do have child care available uh, on that side of the, uh, of the building that if you, know, you need child care, we do have it available. Okay? I just want to let you know because sometimes it's difficult for children to, to, hear this, uh, to, to go through a, a whole service. So we need to, to work lovingly so that God is glorified. Secondly, we need to work urgently because our time is limited. In other words, we don't have forever to accomplish our task. Daylight is limited. Night sets the limit to what we can do. And when night comes, either when we die or when Jesus comes back, our work is finished. And therefore, we must take advantage of every opportunity presented to us. Uh, we must not waste our time on earth. We have a finite amount of time and resources. We don't have forever to do God's work, in other words. And so the, the encouragement in this passage from the Lord Jesus Christ is see people with loving eyes, but also make sure that you, you take advantage of the opportunities that are there because you don't have forever. But what I like about this passage is he doesn't say you do it. He says what? We must work the works. In other words, you don't do it alone. If we were to try to do ministry alone, we would get burned out really fast. And so he says, work lovingly, work urgently, but work dependently on the one who's able to make the blind see. In other words, work with the one, depend on the one who's able to do a miracle in people's lives. Verse 5, he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He said these things. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. I know about you, when I first read that, I thought it was kind of strange. Well, why did Jesus do it that way? He could have just said, see, and the man could have been healed. Why did he need mud? And after creating mud, put it on the man's eyes. I think a couple of things. One is to remind us of creation, of his power when he initially created the world, because it says he made man out of dirt, out of the ground. 
So I think that's one, to remind us of creation. But I, but I think it's also a form of persuasion so that the man is encouraged in his faith to go wash at the pool of Siloam. Uh, somebody puts mud in your eyes, it's going to be irritated, and you're going to be encouraged to wash, right? I, I hope you be encouraged to, to, to wash. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> but so I, I think God in his mercy not only calls us to faith, but many times he encourages us through the circumstances that he surrounds us with to walk in faith. That even that faith that we, that we exercise in the Lord is something that he by his grace, encourages through how he works in our lives. So here he says he anointed the man's eyes with mud, and in, in verse 7 he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I want to know where that is in relation to the temple. So Jesus was at the temple when he says, I am the light of the world. The Jewish leaders tried to kill him. He escapes. He meets this man. He tells them, he puts mud on the man's eyes, and he tells him to wash at the pool of Siloam, which is in the lower city of Jerusalem. Here's a picture of it, of what it looks like today. It is connected to the spring of Gihon, and it's connected by Hezekiah's tunnel. That's why the water is able to come in into the, in, into the walled cities which was of great advantage to them when they were under siege. But he told them to wash here. This is the pool of Siloam. What I love about this is after he washed, after he took that step of faith and obeyed Jesus' command, it says he came back seeing. Again, imagine. imagine. Imagine what it's like to live in total darkness all of your life and all of a sudden to see again. You just imagine as he knelt down as he began to wash in this pool that all of a sudden he, he began to see light penetrate his eyes. The first thing he saw was probably what hands looked like. He probably saw his reflection on the pool, and on that pool he could see the reflection of the sky for the first time. He saw what the sky looked like. For the first time, he saw what the color blue looked like. And as he was walking, he, he could see the faces of people that he just heard, he, he has just previously heard speaking and, and, and previously heard passing by him. And he could see faces for the first time. And as he went back towards his house, all of a sudden it was so much easier because before he had to count steps, before he had to listen, before he had to feel where the corner is, where, where the sidewalk was, where the tree was. And all of a sudden now he could see everything, he could run. And you can imagine him saying all along, I could see. I'm able to see, guys. I could see. And, and knocking at, at his parents' door and, and opening and saying, Mom, Dad, I could finally see. And he, he saw his parents' faces for the first time ever. Imagine what it's like. He says he washed and came back seeing, seeing. God calls us to this type of ministry to help people who are in darkness to, to be translated into light, to help people who are blind to finally see the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are to work, we are to work lovingly to glorify, if we are to glorify God. We are to work urgently because we don't have all the time in the world. All of us have a limited amount of time to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to work dependently on the one who's able to cause the blind to see. The one who is the light of the world. We don't do it alone. Verse 4, Jesus talks about our responsibility by using the word sent or in, a, in an interesting way. Or, or the, the play on words in this passage. It says, we must do the works of the one who sent me. That's a common description of Jesus. And then when he was doing the miracle, he says, go. He sent the man to Siloam, which means sent. And the man went and obeyed. Now notice at the end of John, in John chapter 20, verse 21, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, 
even so I am what? Sending you. We have a work to do, and God has sent us into this dark world to be light. In this passage, we find not only the blindness of the man, we see the boldness of the man for Christ. Why does Jesus open your eyes? So that you could be a witness for him. In verse 8, you find that this man was a witness to the neighbors. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? So you, you could see him celebrating. You could see him saying, I can see, I can see. And people going, what is that all, com that commotion? And they saw somebody that looked like the beggar, but they couldn't believe it was him. In verse 9, some said, it is he. Others said, no, but, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. In verse 10, so they said, then how were your eyes open? They couldn't believe it. Verse 11, he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They couldn't believe it. But he told his neighbors about this man named Jesus. Let me ask you, when was the last time you told your neighbors about Jesus? When was the last time you shared about his miracle God's miracle in your life, of transforming your life. God sent Jesus, and Jesus sends us to be witnesses to our neighbors. He not only witnessed to his neighbors, he witnessed to the religious leader. And this took great boldness. In verse 12, then they said, where is he? He says, I do not know. I'm not sure. Because when I washed my eyes, he wasn't there. So they bring him to the religious leaders. This was such a great event that they bring him to the religious leaders of the nation, to the Sanhedrin. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been, been blind. And it says, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So if you could hear music in the story, there would be like a, a Joss-like music. or Uh-oh. It's a foreshadowing. Of problems. In verse 15, so the Pharisees asked him again how he had received the sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. The Pharisees thought that if you make mud during the Sabbath, that's considered work, and that's considered sin. The Pharisees had all kinds of laws or all kinds of stipulations on how to obey the law. So it says, the Bible says, keep the Sabbath. So they have measured out how many steps could I take before it is considered work? What are the, some of the things that I could do and I need to stop before it's considered work? When we were in Israel, it, it's interesting. They have, I, don't, I forgot if I told you, Sabbath eleva elevators. So during the Sabbath... When we were there, the elevators would stop at every floor. Why? Because pressing the button was considered work. So if, you, if you're in the top floor, sorry, it's going to take you a long time to get to the top floor because you have to stop on every level. And so the, the Pharisees, instead of saying, wow, you were healed, hallelujah, praise the Lord, that's great. He said, this man is a sinner because he healed on a Sabbath and he broke the Sabbath by making mud. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Now, it doesn't say, but I, I could almost hear Nicodemus' voice. Remember last week when Nicodemus came to Jesus at, at night under the cover of night? He says, no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. So you could almost see Nicodemus kind of peeking out of the shadows and being sh shot down and going back into the shadow, <laughs> being a secret disciple of Jesus. Verse 17, so they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? So they couldn't agree. There was a division. There was a debate. Say, so, well, since he healed you, what do you think of him? And he said, I think he's a prophet. Because when he thought about it, 
he, he told them to go, and it was actually Jesus who predicted that his eyes would be opened by washing, so he must be a prophet. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received the sight. They said, oh, we don't believe you. You probably just look like the man who was born blind. And so they called the parents in, and they interviewed the parents. Verse 19, and asked them, is this your son? Who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? In other words, are you sure he's not just a lookalike? Are you sure you didn't have twins and one of them was born blind and one of them could see? Uh, are you part of this ruse? Are you part of this conspiracy? And notice what they said. They were actually scared. Uh, in contrast to the man born blind who was bold, his parents were scared uh, because anyone who affirm that Jesus is who he says he is, they would get kicked out of the synagogue. They would be excommunicated. His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. In other words, it's true. He is our son and he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Actually, they knew, but they didn't want to say. Uh, Nor do we know who opened his eyes. They knew. They didn't want to say. It says, ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. What did they do? They passed the buck back to their son. Ask him. He's old enough. So they called the son a second time. For the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. In other words, tell the truth this time. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. (laughs) How do you argue with that? See, people could could reject your words, but they cannot reject a changed life. They cannot reject or they cannot argue against a transformed life. I know you don't believe in Jesus. Jesus. But let me just tell you, this is how I used to be. This is how I live. This is how I was when I, when I was in darkness. And this is who I am now. This is who I am today. He has changed my life. You could deny somebody's words. You cannot deny a transformed life. In verse 26, then they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And at this point... The, blind man, the, the man born blind was getting a little bit frustrated. He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. So now he begins to troll them. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> so, so at this point, he was kind of just uh, needling them. Verse 28, and they reviled them, saying, you are his disciple." We are disciples of Moses. They were mad. Uh, Verse 29. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. So they they persisted in their unbelief. Verse 30. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. What was was the, the blind man saying? You know what? This is an even bigger miracle that you persist on not believing facts, that it's so obvious who Jesus is, and you refuse to believe. He says, wow. He says, just wow. This is amazing, he says. That, that's an even more miraculous thing than me receiving an eyes, my eyesight. Of course, the religious leader did not take that too well. Verse 31. We, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. And again, notice the insight, the spiritual insight of the blind man, of the man born blind. He, he continues to grow in his understanding of Jesus as he was debating the Pharisees. He says, never since the world began, Has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? It's never been done. In fact, in the Old Testament, one of 
the signs of the Messiah, that Messiah has come, is that Messiah will open the eyes of the blind. In verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. In other words, oh, don't confuse us with facts, kid. Get out of here. So they kicked him out because they couldn't argue with this logic. They couldn't argue against the miracle that they are seeing in, very, in the very front of their eyes. You know, one of the things that this reminds me of is Psalm 27.1. Because when you, have, when you have seen the light, when you have received salvation from the Lord, that should be one of the things that, encur- that should encourage you to be bold for the Lord. Let's read Psalm 27.1, and this is a great verse to memorize. Let's read it together. Ready? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? And so this man born blind, because he has seen the light, was bold not only in witnessing to his neighbors, was bold in witnessing to these religious leaders who were stubborn and refused to believe in Jesus. Are we bold in presenting Jesus to others? The fact that God has saved us and no one can take away that salvation, and the fact that people need the Lord should encourage us to share about Jesus to others. Finally, we see not only the blindness of the man before he met Christ, the boldness of the man after he met Christ, but we see the belief of the man in Christ, the belief of the man in Christ. They kicked him out of the synagogue. Once again, Jesus meets up with him in an act of grace and mercy. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The, fir- the phrase Son of Man is found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. It is one of the titles of Messiah. By the way, we will be studying the book of Daniel next month. That is the next series. So pray for me as I prepare that series. It's, uh, the, the title of the series is Integrity. Integrity. So I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. That's one of the titles of Messiah. So Jesus comes to him and says, do you believe that I am Messiah? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Notice the response. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. What is the goal of everything that we do in this church? It is for people to become worshipers of the Lord. Why do we do what we do? So that people will glorify God. There are three great musts in the book of John. The first is found in John 3, 7, you must be born again. The next is found in John 4, 24, they that... God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the third is found in our passage. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. We must worship. We must be born again. We must work. All those three are important in ministry. Why do we work? So that people are born again. Why do you want people to be born again? So that they become worshipers of God. Missions exist because worship doesn't. And so when, when Jesus does this miracle, the end goal was what? For the man to be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our goal is for people to worship. The story is not about the miracle of Jesus, it is about Jesus. When we work, our goal is not simply to believe, but to worship. It is not just so they could see with their eyes, but so they could see with their hearts. It is not simply to help them physically, but to help them spiritually. Jesus not only healed the man's eyes, he healed 
the man's heart as well. The man believed and he worshipped. One of the things that's fascinating in this passage is the growth of knowledge in this man. At the beginning, he simply said, the man called Jesus. He didn't know much about who Jesus was. It was about just this guy who, who, who healed him, and he just simply called him the man. In verse 17, when the religious leaders challenge him, he says, who is he? He says, well, you know, come to think of it, he's a prophet. As he argued with them, he, he said, do you want to be his disciples also? At that point, he says, I, I want to follow him. I don't want to follow you guys. I want to follow him. Do you also want to follow him? Verse 33, when they challenge him, just, God doesn't answer sinners. And, and the man says, well, how is it that he answered this man's prayer? This man must be from God. And then finally, in our passage, Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man, do you believe that I am Messiah? And he says, what? Lord. So from, from man to what? Now he says, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Are we growing in our understanding of who Jesus is? Peter tells us we are to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Growth in knowledge is not an option if our worship of God is to become deeper and more meaningful, we must grow in our knowledge of Jesus. Are you growing in your knowledge of Jesus? Now, one of the things, ways to do that is, is every year just read through the Gospels. Every year just, just read who Jesus is and what he did, particularly when it comes to, to, to the Passion Week, which a third of the Gospel is about. Read anew how much he loves you. Read again what he taught and what he said and how he acted and how, how he related to people. It is, it is as you grow in your knowledge that will compel you to worship him the way we're supposed to. By the way, if, if you haven't signed up for the workers' training, please sign up. Um, we will be looking at worship by loving God. Worship, or love God by worshiping. Is, is actually the, the title. And that's the, the first thing in our mission statement. We love God, love others, impact the world. Love God by worshiping. So just a $10 um, registration. If you can't afford it, just don't worry about it. Just sign up. But we just want to know how many. And so that, that $10, will, that, that pays for three meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so some, some, when I told that to someone, they said, I'm just going to bring my whole family. Forget the seminar. We just, you know, $10, $10 for three meals. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's not the point of the seminar. Okay. But, but we want to learn about worship. Amen. We want to know what it's like to, to worship God and what it takes to be a worshiper that, that, God, that God is looking for. In, in verse 39, the religious leaders again, again refuted Jesus. He says, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. He says, but now that you say we see, your guilt remains. What is Jesus saying? That if we're humble enough to say, Lord, I'm in darkness, Lord, I'm blind. And there's hope for you. Why? Because there's forgiveness. And Jesus can set you free. But if you insist on saying, I see, I'm good enough, I don't need the light, I am doing pretty well on my own, guess what? Jesus says, then your sin remains. Only those, only those who admit that they need the Lord, who admit that they are in darkness because of their sins, he says, only those are the people that God is able to give the miracle of sight. Only those who admit their need of the Lord Jesus Christ are given the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. I like the way Kent Hughes puts it. The light of the world has gone into the dark world with the result that a blind man saw not only with his eyes, but with his heart. And those who had vision were blinded because they refuse to believe. 
I am the light of the world. We saw the blindness of the man before he met Christ. The boldness of the man in testifying for Christ. The belief of the man in Christ that resulted in worship. What we learn in this passage is in a world blinded by sin, we are to work and witness for Jesus so that others may see and worship him. In a world blinded by sin, we are to work and witness for Jesus so that others may see and worship him. Jesus asked this man who had been healed the most important question in the world, which is this. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe that Jesus loves you? He died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. Have you put your faith in him? as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if today you've come and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come to him right now. In the quietness of this moment, if that's the desire of your heart, would you pray the simple prayer with me, just quietly in your heart? Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, I, I believe I'm in darkness. But I thank you, Lord, that you, you rose again the third day. And I'm here right now just praying to receive you into my heart, believing that it's through faith in you alone that I could receive the light. So Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Father, I thank you for anyone who's prayed that prayer to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, to put their faith in him alone to save them. And I pray, Father, that you would help these individuals to grow in their, in their faith in you. If you are a believer, perhaps God is speaking to you about growing in your, in your knowledge of Jesus. Maybe this year you would spend more time uh, reading your Bible and in fellowship with Jesus. Maybe this year... You, God is calling you to be more consistent in your worship of Jesus. That, that Sunday is, is not just an optional thing to, to go to church, but it becomes a habit for you and your family. Maybe God is calling you to do that. And so if God has spoken to your heart, uh, would you just make those commitments to him? Maybe just maybe you, you, you've been called out of darkness, but you find yourself hiding in, in the shadows. Hiding in the shadows by not witnessing about Jesus, not caring about the loss. Or maybe there's darkness in your life that you have not shined the light of Jesus upon. And whatever God has spoken to you about today, would you just apply this message personally? Father, I thank you for... for the prayers that have been offered up to you in faith. And I, I pray, Father, that you would help us to walk in the light. We thank you, Lord, for helping us see. We thank you, Lord, because apart from you, we would still be blind. And so I ask, Lord, would you help us to, to look at people with the same compassion, with the same love that Jesus had for this man. Help us, Father, to not take for granted Lord, the opportunities that you give us to share the light with those around us. Help us to understand that as, as you have sent Jesus, Jesus sends us into this dark world. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time, let's all rise.